what is health span? So if we imagine it as a curve, right? Health span is like the years that are free from disease, right? So it could be cancer, mm. it could be heart attack, stroke, it could be Alzheimer's, dementia, or metabolic syndrome like diabetes. Right? I'm Kenneth, I'm the co-founder CEO of MitoHealth, and we've been around for about a year now, and we exist very much in the longevity tech space. The size of the challenge is eight billion people, right? In one line. Insurance is the best investment that pays you the most when you need it the most. If you get cancer, that's a payout. If you get heart attack, that's a payout. If you get into a car accident and you're in the hospital, there's also a payout or they even pay for your bid. Vipassana meditation is a silent retreat. So it's a 10-day silent retreat. Uh, it can be done everywhere around the world and you spend 10 days uh, essentially just meditating and not talking to anyone. My wife did it, changed her life. Then my mom did it, changed her life as well. Did it change your life? Did it. Yeah, uh, so I'm Kenneth. I'm the co-founder, CEO of Mito Health. And we've been around for about a year now. And we exist very much in the longevity tech space, which is a very new field that is up and coming uh, in this part of the world. So before we dive into that, you also built a finance community because it's called Seedly. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to understand your upbringings. Can you mm -hmm. describe what your childhood was like? Yeah. So I grew up with a brother, an elder brother, and then wasn't a very bright student for a while, but was very naturally inclined to the sciences. So I always knew that I was going to do something in science. Uh, but back then when we were growing up, tech wasn't a thing, right? So, I mean, there was like Game Boys, there were Nokia phones, but I was never really good at like programming or, or Dreamweaver, right? Website building. So I was always exploring the idea of tech. And during my university days, I really got into it. So I realized that tech and back then, uh, mobile phones were really becoming a thing. So iOS, app development, Android development, Uh, and then I realized that hey, actually there's a lot of business to be done in terms of bringing uh, business and tech, the, the two worlds together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, I dive deep into that. My father was an entrepreneur, so he was doing paper trading for his whole life. Very traditional business and you saw how money flowed. So it's interesting because you... Can you explain you, what paper trading is yeah, for the um, audience? So basically he would import and sell paper. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a bit of import-export element without actually holding the stock. So it's the first version of drop shipping. Mm -hmm. if you, uh, so the idea there is you buy huge reams of paper. So really like huge containers and pallets of paper from Europe. You would sell them to Indonesia. You would go to Indonesia. You would process the paper. You would sell it to somewhere in Southeast Asia. So you would always be the connector. Back then, internet wasn't a thing. So you mm -hmm. would fax, you would call, you would email early days of email. And then there was, a, there was a business for that. But when things were disintermediated, like with Alibaba, with online exchanges for paper, even there's exchanges for paper as well, then the middleman, the role of the middleman became less and less important. So what, yeah. did, he do? what did he do at that moment? Uh, so he was slowly winding it down and then suddenly he got into a very bad accident. Uh, when he was 50 years old, he was cycling. He got hit by a taxi, did a full body MRI, found that he had brain cancer, which is also uh, something crazy because I was going through that tough period while building my first startup uh, in year two, I think, yeah, of building Sidley as a personal finance community. And I saw how important like health was, right? Because immediately everything before that was irrelevant. The businesses he's built, the money he's made, the properties he's owned, Everything is irrelevant because now the most pressing problem was the disease. So 50 to 54, very poor quality of life. And then uh, he left us at 54. Yeah. You're saying 50 to 54, very poor quality of life. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the life quality that he had before that mm -hmm. contributed to a cancer? There was a lot of stress, definitely, as an entrepreneur, because the whole business was on him. Uh, he had a mouse to feed, right? Two sons, a wife. 
various properties that he's purchased, he would need to pay the mortgages. Um, there's a lot of uh, innate desire to want more because entrepreneurs always want more and more mm. and thereby doing more and more, late nights, trading. Um, so I think there, there, is element, there, there were elements of that. But I think the big one was really uh, not knowing that there was a tumor growing in his brain until it was too late. So I think knowing er- earlier would help a lot. Um, which is also where uh, it's part of the inspiration of like why we're doing what we're doing in, in Mito Health. Yeah. yeah. So obviously it impacted uh, your main activity because it's what you're doing right now, right? But also how did this change your way of thinking about life in mm-hmm. general? Without health, there is no wealth. Yeah. So that's the big underlying uh motivation of what we do. Uh, we understand that that wealth is this ladder that everyone climbs. But only recently, I would say within the last three to five years, you start realizing the people who have achieved wealth are moving all their efforts to health, right? So you yeah, have it, yeah. yeah, because it's almost like you you get yourself to a miserable place to mm-hmm. achieve wealth as quickly as possible. Mm-hmm. And then you realize, man, yeah. I have this money, but I feel like shit. <laughs> and you, not only you feel like shit, right? You can't spend it. So there is, there is limited time to spend the amount of wealth you've created. So one school of thought is that how do you balance both enough? Because that is important, right? That is very, very important. And that's also why we focus on the younger audiences in our marketing. So how yeah. do you balance? How do you balance wealth building, mm-hmm. which... You don't have to get there in three years. You have 30 years, 40 years because you, you, you don't want to retire anyway. Otherwise, you're going to be bored. Yeah. How do you balance wealth building with, with health, keeping your health yeah. and thinking about that much earlier? Yeah. How good are you at that? Because yeah. you were talking about all this stuff, but you're building businesses. And yeah. we both know that when you build businesses, yeah. you can have all your best principles. Yeah. And then you do the practical. And then yeah. you're like, man, I'm again on the edge. Yeah. Fuck, I'm almost yeah. burning out. Yeah. Or I'm burnt out. Or, you know, like, so how do you yeah. balance this yourself, yeah. knowing all that stuff, yeah. preaching that stuff yeah. with your new business and yeah. having had this experience with your dad? Yeah. So what was interesting was that the moment my dad got cancer, I realized how important insurance was, right? That's mm. the first very big point. Yeah. That's an amazing point. Yeah. We need to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> because. Yeah. I'm thinking about my ex-girlfriend, but probably a lot of people here, Mm. right? Mm. I'm like, do you have any insurance Mm. for the big stuff, right? Mm. Because, oh, she's an actress, self-employed. So basically, oh, you're an entrepreneur. Oh, I'm an entrepreneur. We need to have an insurance. Mm -hmm. I don't exactly know how it works for employees if they have an insurance. Why is it so important for people? Why should it be a priority for people to have a health insurance? Yeah. Everyone should yeah. have a health insurance. Yeah. Why? Yeah. In one line, insurance is the best investment that pays you the most when you need it the most. Right? So let me break it down there. Uh, if you think about investments, you're always riding the wave, right? S&P 500, Bitcoin, crypto, Ethereum, right? Stocks like Tesla. You never know when it will pay you. Right? So you never know when the dividends come. You never know when your growth stock is really going to, to grow. But insurance is the investment that you pay every year that pays you the most when you really need it the most. So if you frame it up, insurance generally pay out when there is a big problem or big disease that you have, you have uh, encountered. You get cancer, that's a payout. If you get heart attack, that's a payout. If you get into a car accident and you're in the hospital, there's also a payout or they even pay for your bid, right? It's the bottom line, yeah. So in in my previous life in personal finance, we always talk about insurance as a goalkeeper. Mm. No matter how many strikers you have, no matter how many Ronaldo's, Messi's, Mo Salah's you have, if you don't have a goalkeeper, a good goalkeeper, it's not about how many goals you score, but about the net score, right? How many goals you concede. So that's incredibly important. Did your dad have an insurance? Yes. Which is why we didn't need to sell our homes. 
And that's a very real story. Uh, do, you have, yeah. do you have examples of people mm -hmm. that you know or that you've heard of who had a cancer yeah. or a heart attack and had to sell their Many. home or... Many, yeah. It's very real because treatment is not cheap. Uh, and even in Singapore where subsidized care is generally available, if you want private care, which is faster, quicker, better, more advanced uh, in terms of chemo, radiation and surgery, generally speaking, you need to pay a lot more. And what happens is, again, at that point, you realize that without health, there is no wealth. So if a loved one is starting to go through those phases and you start to realize that, you know what, I don't have enough to cover his surgery uh, that by this top neurosurgeon or this top oncologist to, to do the cancer follow-up treatment, you tend to like, you know what, everything is not important, right? I need to gather the funds and pay for this treatment because I value this person's life. But that could have all been prevented if you value this person's life before all these things happen, yeah. Do you have some concrete numbers on like how much an operation for, obviously it depends on a cancer yeah. or a heart attack, but yeah. these things that happen much more than people think. Yeah. Because we I say can, yeah. one person out of two will have cancer in their life. Yeah, one, right? of, one of two to three. Yeah, yeah. so I, I read woman, yeah. one out of two, men, uh, one out of three. Yeah. Th then I was like shocked. Then yeah. if you dig a bit deeper, it's because yeah. people are getting older yeah. and you are, but still, you're yeah. going to have a cancer. Yeah. Let's say you have one chance out of two to get a cancer. Yeah. Mm. How much do I spend? Just like some rough numbers. Yeah. So mm -hmm. people think, fuck, do I even yeah. have this money somewhere? Yeah. Or am I going to actually lead my entire family, parents, uh, 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 children, brothers, sisters? To ruin yeah. financial ruin financial just ruin, because yeah. I'm not taking an insurance. I can give a real example. So my dad's neurosurgery top doctor, like one surgery is $50,000 sing, right? So put it in context, maybe it's about 30, 30 to 35 grand USD. Yeah. Uh, and that's just a surgery. It doesn't include the warts. It doesn't include the chemo. It doesn't include the radiation that followed thereafter. And all those things were covered, thankfully, because of insurance. That's a big one. And even the out, what we call outpatient care. So outpatient is like the follow-up therapy. Mm. So he couldn't walk. He couldn't speak. He couldn't eat. So he had to have help. Um, so some of this is covered by the government. Mm. There are policies for that. But a lot of it was insurance related. So very grateful for so that. So we're talking about yeah. hundreds of thousands, if not hundreds millions. Hundreds of thousands, yeah. Hundreds of thousands is the average. Millions is if, if you want more advanced therapies. So there are more advanced therapies, even in Singapore and US, Hong Kong, where you there's more advanced radiation techniques like gamma knife, right? You go very specific. There's precision oncology, which is becoming a big thing as well. So all those things are happening and all those things cost money. Yeah. Some insurance allows for those. Yeah. What was your relationship with your parents? When growing up? Great, great. I think they were both working parents uh, and they always catered time for my brother and I and always allowed us to fail, which is very different, I think, when it comes to uh, most traditional Asian families where, you know, you have to do well in this area and then, like, do well in your studies, become a doctor, lawyer, which is a great path. But I think my mom and my dad allowed me to experiment with businesses. They funded my first company, failed hor horribly. Uh, and then the second one, we were out on the streets raising capital, but you sort of learn, you know, as you go along. So I think them putting in at first, however much thousand dollars, right? So I think they gave us 10K, like to try something out, failed. Uh, I paid, back, paid, paid it back to them over time. Um, but yeah, I think it, that, that belief that it's, Oh, it's okay to fail, right? And where, then you where, go out. Yeah. Where do you think this was coming from? Because it's um, really not hmm. the way a lot of parents, I would say in general, yeah. and even less so in Asia. Yeah. My mom was an engineer. So she was an electrical engineer, spent quite a bit of time in the States. So she understood innovation. And then she didn't understand the startup and mobile tech wave. But I think naturally that... Innovation in itself is a lot, it's building on failures, right? So even in the startup world, every day we are experiencing some form of failure. 
It's big, it's small, running out of money. It's all part and parcel of the process, right? Team members falling out, investors not wanting to f- f- continue to fund you, finding an alternative. Yeah, we, we would know this as entrepreneurs. Yeah. So it's a lot of failures. Yeah. Every day. Every day. <laughs> Every second of the yeah. day. Yeah. So you grew up in Singapore and we talked about I mean, you have parents who are very Mm open-minded, very lucky for that. I had a guest previously, she's called Simone Heng, and we talked about the Asian upbringing, Mm -hmm. often pretty tough, and how it actually results in our generation Mm -hmm. having more mental health issues than ever before Mm -hmm. because of how we're being raised. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially Asian people, right? Yeah. What are your thoughts on that as a smart dude who is building something in the health sector? Yeah. And and more generally, how much do you think Singapore is doing a good job mm. to kind of promote mental health and help people talk about their mental health issues? Yeah, I think COVID was a big push for that because once, you know, we, we tend to forget this by now, but people were stuck at home for a long time. Uh, during COVID and I think it really showed how important mental health was because people were lonely, they were detached, there were little to no social interactions. Um, so it opened the door for conversations around mental health and I think most recently we are seeing more suicide right, by youth and yeah. Continue. I have something to say regarding that. Yeah. Because when I came to to challenge basically what you're saying. Mm. When I came to Singapore in 2021, I was thinking, oh man, Singapore mastered COVID. No. Oh. I mean, it was before the all these lockdowns. And exactly. Yeah. But I was thinking, oh, they mastered COVID. There is only two or 300 cases in yeah. the beginning, right? Yeah. What they were not saying at the same time. Yeah. You said COVID is good for, uh, it was good to, for these mental health yeah. things, right? What I kind of understood or at least read is that maybe Singapore had 300 cases of COVID, right? And zero death. Mm. But there were 10% of these 300 cases of COVID Mm -hmm. suicides or even Mm. more. And they were not talking about the suicide. No Mm. one was talking about that. No Mm. newspaper, right? So it's, we mastered COVID, uh, we're good, no one died, but actually there is many people who died from suicide because mm. of these rules, right? Yeah. So do you really think Singapore is doing a decent job mm. at talking about mental health issues? Or or do you think they're trying, but there yeah. is also this Asian culture yeah. where it's a kind of a stigma to talk about mental health and suicide and all these yeah. things, which is happening a lot. Yeah. I think the stigma definitely exists, um, much like the stigma around money exists much like the stigma around inheritance, around uh, LGBTQ rights, like all these things still exist in pockets uh, or rather in, in, broad, in broad strokes. But I think in, in, in various communities, it could be in your company, it could be in our social circles. Like people, I would say, tend to would find ways to, to talk about their problems, to learn. So we ran a community, finance community. I'll talk about the stigma from a finance because it's sort of parallel to, to a, a thing Absolutely. that yeah, people don't talk about. And, Absolutely. And, and not earning enough, high inflation rates, cost of living. We, we had a lot of anonymous questions and you would see how the community would rally around problems and give creative and constructive suggestions to help the individual online. And this was like peak COVID. So we started realizing people gathered online. We had frequent podcasts, meetups, uh, online again, virtually, AMAs, where people would come and then they would talk about their problems financially. So I'm, I'm not an expert in mental health, but when we look at the parallels, people, you know, divorce with two kids. How do you split up the, uh, the, the, the custody of the kids? Like all these things were talked about quite a lot online. Why, yeah. why is there a stigma around these themes? Why is, for mm-hmm. example, let's take personal finance one. Yeah. Why is there a stigma in Asia or in Singapore at least yeah. around personal finances and around money? Yeah. 
there's this thing in in the Chinese culture in particularly is called mian zi, which is a face. So it's it's a lot of ego and perception that you should put forward a front that is a lot more well well focused. So even if you know like in Chinese New Year, all the greetings uh uh, in part, right? It's all about wealth. Like you know, I wish you wealth, and then you wish me wealth. It's like mm. it's not it's not so much about health. It's usually more about health, our uh, wealth. So it's about money. It's about making more money. So money is a very touchy topic, and a large chunk of it is is growing up. You know, not everyone might have been as fortunate, so they would have earlier years where money is scarce. You grew up thinking you need to get a degree to get a job to earn a decent salary. So it's it's been inculcated since a very, very young age for a lot of people. Yeah. So that's culture. <laughs> Is it one of the reasons why you started Seedly? Yes. We started it because it was not well spoken about in the community. So but when we were started eight years ago, the only real places to get information around money were very traditional financial bloggers, so on Blogspot and Tumblr and those. Uh, and not only those, right? You would get like forums like Hardware Zone, which is very trashy. So people would would would, would scream, at, scream at each other. They would, it's those online forum bots, right? So then it's not very constructive. It's not designed well. And then there was a growth in terms of what we call finfluencers, uh, familiar with the term, financial mm -hmm. influencers. Yep. So people who are willing to put themselves out there to say, this is how much I earn, this is how much I spend, this is how much I invest, this is how much I save. Mostly through blogs? Uh, mostly through Instagram. So Instagram was picking up seven, eight years ago. Already seven, eight years ago, people on Instagram yeah. saying, okay, this is how much I, okay. Yeah. This is how my, my, I manage a budget. This is how yeah. I invest my money. This is how yeah. I'm going to, this entire fire. Exactly. Fire movement really started picking up. And the cool thing Can was that- Can you explain that, what fire movement is? Yeah. So financial independence retire early. The goal is to amass enough wealth so that you have a very sustained uh, income flow so that you wouldn't have to think about your cost of living, right? It's all covered. You have a house, you have a roof over your head. You can take care of your basic necessities. Um, so it's, yeah. it's almost a, a revolution mm. from youngsters against the, you need to work until 65 yeah. or 70 or 67 or 64, yeah. depending on the country, to retire. Yep. You can take control of your finances and future today yeah. and stop working at 30 or 35 or 40. And it doesn't mean yeah. you're going to become ultra rich. It's yeah. just understanding the basics of budgeting yeah. and making money, saving, yeah. investing a chunk of it. Yeah. And then making sure that my nest egg at some point is big enough yeah. to cover my expenses that could be low. Mm -hmm. Right for the rest of my life, then so you I draw can stop, down. Yeah, exactly. So I can stop uh, working earlier, or work on something that is more meaningful to me, or move somewhere else. Yeah, and the cool thing in all of that is that five years ago, people were more and more open to talk about finances because it was no longer this thing where you could only get it from financial advisors. So this was a mm. shift. Uh, are you familiar with the concept buy term invest the rest BTR? No, it became a so. The concept around life insurance, there's usually two types. There's whole life and term life. So whole life, you pay a lot more premiums and then there's some there's some stop value, cash value at the end of the day. Term life, you're just paying for protection. So you're paying for exactly, if you die today, what's the, the payout for you? At the end of the day, like maybe when you're 60, 70, there is no longer any cash value associated. Um, so people started realizing that, hey, there is this vehicle that is designed for protection. So it's my goalkeeper. So now I can take that money, you know, and then with the rise of robo-advisors, it all came hand in hand. Robo-advisors offered the opportunity to invest in low-cost index funds that are globally diversified. So then with the marketing, with the, with the upheaval of the financial do-it-yourself movement, finance became something that is very well talked about. We think the same will happen for health. Mm. Yeah, so that's long story short of like why we think that in health and mental health being one of them, cardiovascular health being another one, more and more people coming together to talk about biohacking. Like all these things are very ground up. It's very DIY, do it yourself. Yeah. Are you a fire movement, I'd say fan or are you part of this? Yes. Are you since yes. a young age saying, how do I make money and invest so I can 
Yes. Not to retire because you don't want you to don't retire. retire, especially yeah. if you're an entrepreneur, you would like, yeah. you would go crazy. Yeah. Uh, having nothing to do and not having a, yeah. a bigger mission. But yeah. how are you personally doing yeah. on that stuff? So having worked for seven, eight years, like I've personally amassed a decent amount of, of money, right? To be able to go into another startup. Because like not many people with uh, liabilities in the early days like kids, right? So kids, no matter what we talk about them, they're great, they're cuddly, but they cost a lot of money, right? Mm. So you have a kid, you have a house. The thing is not to overstretch yourself. So I live in public housing, right? So I live in a HDB BTO with my wife mm. and we're happy, right? So we don't need to overstretch ourselves. There's no reason to do that. Uh, and the thing about fire is it's really that principle, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's not how I'm going to become a multimillionaire and retire early. It's more, how can I live, how can I be smart about yeah. my money and yeah. live as simply as possible yeah. to be free as quickly as possible. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You started Sidley right after university, if I'm not In university. Wrong. Yeah. University. Okay. Yeah. Do you think aspiring entrepreneurs should jump straight on the entrep entrepreneurship train after uni or do you think they should spend a few years getting some experience out there and maybe, maybe building a network before yeah. starting a business? There's two schools of thought. So for my school of thought, I feel that if there is going to be more and more opportunity costs to starting later, then you should do it from day one. So the other path I could have taken is to join uh, management consulting, investment banking, private banking, uh, you know. So that's a very, very clear path, right? So it's a very clear defined path. Um, but by going on to those paths, like you naturally have higher and higher opportunity costs because if, of your standard of living, your increased expenses, the social circles you would be around. So I, I, I made a decision very early on. I love startups. I love, love startups. Like 10 years in, I still love startups every day. It's just what problem are we solving, right? How do we really get like get things done, right? Don't just beat around the bush. Don't just talk, right? Just come together, do things. And that has been my belief. Um, it might not work for everyone because some people would prefer stability. The risk appetite is not as strong. Yeah. yeah. There's no such thing as stability in a startup. No. Nope. <laughs> yeah. Roller coaster <laughs> of emotions. Yeah. It's interesting because um I started my first company right after uni too, mm. at 23 years old. Yeah. And I had the same, kind of same experience as you. Yeah. My parents helped me out for my first yep. year, mm -hmm. like by helping me pay the flat. In, yeah. I was, I was in London building the first business. Yeah. We're lucky, with, right? I with mean, two, to have, super yeah. lucky. Yeah. With two other dudes. Yeah. Actually, I would even like say, instead of having your parents funding an MBA or whatever kind of master's, oh, yeah. Yeah. if they can fund you your first year. You learn so much, right? Yeah. Of entrepreneurship, just the basics, like a flat or a, a room, like a, a shit room somewhere yeah. and some shit food. Yeah. Like Ramen. this is the best <laughs> freaking investment they can yeah. do in yourself because, yeah. because the, the potential returns after that are, are, are limitless. Yeah. Um, and I had the same thinking also. I was thinking, I was actually, before being in London, I was in Hong Kong and Singapore for some internships. And my idea was like you, mm. I wanted to be a McKinsey consultant. Yeah. Yeah, Why? I don't standard, know, because right? it's hard, yeah. you know, like yeah. it's hard, it's the hardest thing. Perceived. It's perceived to be hard. Yeah, it's yeah. especially to get in there. Exactly. Yeah. And I was like, and then yeah. they tell you, you will get hired by a client and you have a good position, etc. Yeah. Which, which makes a lot of sense, yeah. I think, still today. Yeah. But I was talking to these McKinsey consultants, I mean, previous Goldman Sachs bankers or previous McKinsey consultants who were 45 and now running a startup, mm -hmm. right? You meet them everywhere in Singapore, in Hong yeah. Kong. It's very easy. You go out, you can randomly talk and then yeah. they'll tell you, I'm building this company. I'm 43. I wish I had started my company when I was your age, yeah. 22. Yeah. And then you're like, yeah, I thought I want to go to McKinsey, but you're telling me that you wish you hadn't gone to McKinsey yeah. and you had started at my age. Mm? Yeah. What? And that's where I realized that this thing where you take basically no risk, especially yeah. if you have some support from your parents, yeah. you take zero risk mm -hmm. because you're yeah. starting right away. It's going to be very hard because you have no network, no one yeah. trusts you in terms of business. Yeah. 
So business connections, you have none, which is hard because mm -hmm. you can have a lot of friends or a lot of people who have great you know, jobs or who are very yeah. powerful. They're, they're going to like you as a person, but they, they don't trust you in terms of business. So it's going to be useless. You yeah. have to prove yourself. Yeah. And when you're 22 or 23, no one kind of yeah. believes in you. Yeah. I mean, you need to have like that person who's going to believe, believe, believe in you, but still hard, but you don't take any risk. You don't have a family. You don't yeah. have... And you're not used to have a certain lifestyle yet that comes with yeah. the McKinsey or exactly. whatever other type of salary, right? Yeah. So I had the exact same thinking and I was talking to my friends who were all in BCG, McKinsey, UBS, and yeah. like they would tell me, man, I'm earning, I'm earning a dad salary, you know, yeah. like, especially in yeah. Switzerland. I yeah. was in London, but yeah. like my friends, because I'm Swiss, Swiss, they were right? in Switzerland yeah. working for McKinsey, making yeah. like first salary, 15K yeah. sing dollar a month, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I was like, I'm making yeah. zero every month <laughs> for the ne first year. Negative. <laughs> and second year, I was so proud. I was like, oh, now yeah. we pay ourselves one yeah. point, yeah. uh, 1,850 pounds yeah. net, net. Yeah. per month. Yeah. Because there's a big difference between gross and net, especially in the UK, and especially when you earn that yeah. not much, right? Yeah. But I was like, man, I know it's the right thing to yeah. do because yeah. this keeps you alive, is, right? Yeah. I realized I can live on very low means. Mm -hmm. And as long as I'm able to do that, I'm able to work on whatever I want and build yeah. something that's potentially much bigger later yeah. on. Yeah. So no brainer. Yeah, I, I would love to share a story as well. So it's it's one that um with this recent medical startup, it's interesting because we had to convince uh, a doctor to leave the public service to to join us, and uh, my co-founder or chief medical officer Ryan, right? Like he he would have been able to easily get a job as a specialist anywhere to set up a private practice like his own GP. But it's interesting because after talking to him and, and really in depth, he, the way he rationalized it, it was that these opportunities will always be there. Absolutely. Right? And Absolutely. Then, then that opportunity cost becomes so much bigger because how often would you have a chance to build something with great, smart people? Uh, and again, startups, you need to start things with, with people you feel like you can learn from. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I felt like very happy because it's, it's very clear to him that this other lucrative house, he realized and rationalized that, that it's, it's there. So this is a very natural decision to, to make because none of his peers would be able to do that. Do yeah. you think you would have made the same decision at a much younger age coming mm -hmm. out of you know, I don't know how many years, six, seven, eight years of medicine. It's very hard. Yeah, seven years. Yeah. So seven years of medicine. And then you're like, oh, I'm just going to kind of ditch my seven years of study to start something in the health tech field. Mm. Or do you think you would have been able to do that? Or is it because he has, he's a certain age. He's yeah. like, I know what corporate medicine looks like, yeah. right? It's not going anywhere anyway. Mm. I can set up my own practice, but I'm also more mature to understand yeah. like, I know what the doctor life yeah. looks like already, yeah. right? Yeah, I think for, for this setup, definitely. So there's a lot of of clarity in thought what the other paths might look like, right? And it's very different from someone coming out from, from school. So like when we came out from school, when we started, it was a very natural path. And quite honestly, when I share with you is because when we started, investment was already like we were lucky and the networks compounded so for my first earlier days of networking we found investors so the moment investors put in money you have to start mm -hmm. so so that was like the first startup where uh or rather it's the the Sydney, right when we when we were in school we were leaving school and then investors came in and said okay you know what? i'm gonna fund you you better start a company because i need to put the money somewhere right and then for you to to try and make that into something for this one, it's very much thought through, right? It's like, okay, there's this big problem we are trying to solve around preventative longevity health. Like, do we have the best skill sets? We think so. Do we have the best capital structure? We think so. Like, finding the best investors. Yeah, so to, to attack the problem. What, what would you tell um, 20, 21, 22 years old student mm -hmm. who studied five years law, for example, or yeah. accounting? Yeah. Right, what most parents are very proud of, or medicine, yeah, medicine what yeah. most parents are very proud of here, right? Yeah, plus you studied all these years, but now today I feel like I should be building a startup in music, mm. which has nothing to do yeah. with my background, right? So yeah. I have two things one is 
my parents mm-hmm. pressure yeah again in in the world in general probably even more here in asia or in yeah. singapore and second i even feel like i've kind of wasted my time the last five years and it's if i don't leverage what i've done in these studies for my future it's wasted or it's something. yeah exactly yeah. it's a kind of a sunk cost you know mm. what would you tell them to do i would tell them to put together a business case yeah so i i did that as well with my parents right so if they are fortunate enough to be in those fields of study highly likely they have parents who are pretty logical in terms of the way that they think through problems the way they think through uh, a fox in the road right so this is a fork in the road right it's, you close door a you open door b so put together a case why is door b going to be way bigger an opportunity what are the safety nets in door b so for asian parents they love the concept of a safety net right what is the the the, the strike zone right of door b so even if it doesn't work out, you could land yourself at a job at, at one of the, the big four consulting. Or because you, you completed your master in accounting, for exactly, example. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So you, you got to give the scenarios, put together the case, talk about market, right? Like why is this such an exciting market to build the music industry a product? You've thought through, you've met enough people. So I think going in without a business case generally feels like a bad idea because uh, parents in this part of the world are very logical, generally mm. speaking. Yeah. So you, Sidley, mm-hmm. I think there was about at the top 1.1 million monthly users. Yeah. How did this turn out as a venture the experience? What went well? What went wrong? What went well? So overall, we knew we were very mission driven. So the mission in Sidley was to make better financial decisions for everyone in the community, our readers, users, partners. So that meant that we could play the role of the connector. So the connector being that if a client or a user comes to us, we would tell them which is the best card to use, what is the best robo-advisor to use, brokerage, savings account. So that was consistent all the way through. Um, and we had an exit to an e-commerce company. We divested to a financial group. So that was great for us, for the team. Uh, and the team made up quite well from, from that whole experience. I think what's not so good was in terms of certain strategic things we could have done better naturally. Um, hiring could have been better. Setting up the team structure, the capital structure could have been better so that we, we could actually decide uh, various more options and not, not just be forced to certain options that we were going to choose at the end of the day. Yeah, so these things are very tactical. So you learn as you go and then you get better with every startup because this is going to be a long, long journey, right? You're not just going to start one company, you're going to start five, six companies, seven companies. Why did you leave? It was time. It was time to go. So seven years in, uh, we achieved what we wanted to do in Singapore. Um, there wasn't really like a regional play because we joined a group that was regional in nature. So we had bases in Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, uh, and it was right time to hand over the, the reins to a, a new kind of successor to take the business forward. Uh, and I personally, I'm more of like a zero to one mm. guy. And most startup entrepreneurs are like that. They are not in it for like the one to hundred. So either two things happen. They hire someone in to do that part of the business or they just leave and and sell the business to someone else who can, who, can who, who, who could do that. Yeah. What did you do after? Took a break, a uh, long break. Why did you take yeah. a long break? Um, so we have aligned that this journey is crazy, right? In terms of uh, the hours you put in, like last night at 3 a.m., I was just thinking about problems to solve. So it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's crazy. Like you, you can never really have a good night's rest. So I think that period was actually a very good period because it's really like, there's no worries at all. You know, you have enough savings. You can draw down for X amount of months. So I took about six months off. Um, yeah, and I traveled a bit, went to Europe, went to a few conferences here and there, get inspired again. Get inspired like a child, right? So not not like a, oh, I'm in it because I have an agenda. I want mm. to I want to make, a business partnership. I want to network with this person because just, you know, very pure, want to know people. I met so many different people in that time. 
really no agenda. Yeah. Really no agenda. Or, just inspired. Want to be inspired. Yeah. Or I'm going to take a break to find the, what's my next big thing. There's always that. Somewhere. There's always inside. that. Yeah. But it's, it's, more, <laughs> it's more latent. It's not. It's, it's more not, like I'm yeah. sleeping. It's like when we have an idea, but yeah. you sleep o- yeah. o- on it, right? It. No, like there's no rush, it. no pressure. Um, so so it was not like yeah. a six month kind of deadline. It's more like, okay, it's going to be more or less a few months, but I don't really yeah. know when. Don't know where. Yeah. And I know a few people going through that now. So very top executives um, in startups, series CD companies, and then they just took a break because they can afford to take a break. And it's, it's very lucky to be able to do that. So you kind of need to very uh, be very conscious about taking a break. You know, it's a big thing about mental health is that you need to be conscious about those down times, it be in the day, right, late at night, or in your life, in your work life. After two years, you take a break. Yeah. Say, says the one who thinks about work at 3 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> very conscious yeah. about the day taking a break. <laughs> the day, but not the night. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. You did an Iron Man during this yes. break, right? Yeah. Why? Uh, I met someone at uh, in Switzerland, actually. So I was there for a conference, a Web3 conference, interestingly. Uh, and I went to the top of uh, Pilatus, Mount Pilatus. Yes. And so there was this 60-year-old man who was doing a, a run. He ran up the mountain, one side of the mountain. And then I was sitting there at the top, enjoying the view. And then we it was quite crowded, so we had to share seats. So he was in his running gear. I was like... Did you take the cable car up here or what? Like what? He said, oh, I parked on the other side. I ran up. He's like, I've done so many Ironmans. I've done ultra marathons and I'm like 60. So how did he look? He looked good. He looked good. Yeah. He looked definitely not 60, right? Maybe Mm. 40s, late 40s. Mm -hmm. And I was very inspired. I was like, if I would want to do those things when I'm 60, I I have to try to start doing them now. And there's no reason for me not to. Mm -hmm. So... Again, I'm addicted to challenge. I'm addicted to pain in, in some sense. Uh, so I decided that why not I give myself a challenge? The goal is to not die. The goal is to finish, right? The, so I did the 70.3. So it's, it's half, but it's still a crazy kind of uh, swim, bike, and run. Uh, and the distances really like, you know, you would feel like six hours, seven hours of, 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 of a race, right? How long did you prepare for that? So I spent around three months yeah, so I full time full time preparing on that. Yeah, full time. So got a triathlon coach. Um, went to swim squat twice a week. Went to track squat twice a week. Had my own biking sessions on the weekend. I got my own bike. I got my own trainer at home. Uh, in terms of like the the thing you attach onto the bike, so it's a bit safer than going on the roads. Yeah, so it's really all in. You set aside a budget. So I think setting aside budgets are crucial for this kind of uh, endeavors as well. Yeah. You told me you also did the Vipassana retreat. Yes. Was it during that time? Yes, it was during that time. So it was exactly about a year ago, so September last year. Um, and soon after I did it, I realized that many entrepreneurs reached out. Because when I talked about it, many different entrepreneurs started, started reaching out to us about the experience, what I learned. So first, what is a Vipassana yeah. meditation and why did you do that? So Vipassana meditation is a silent retreat. So it's a 10-day silent retreat. Uh, It can be done everywhere around the world. There are centers all over the world. And it's all almost pro bono. So it's a donation basis. You go there, there is no expectation of of any amount that you pay. The food is provided, accommodation is provided, uh, bathing facilities are provided. And you spend 10 days uh, essentially just meditating and not talking to anyone. And the reason I did it is because my my wife did it. Back then, girlfriend, she did it. Uh, in between jobs as well. Changed her life. Then my mom did it after my dad passed away. Changed her life as well in terms of how she thought about her problems. And then I wanted to do it because there isn't a better time in between jobs. Like You don't have any commitments, no emails to check. Yeah. Did it change your life? Did it. How? It did. So spending 10 days alone... As an adult, without talking to anyone, it's a very big challenge and you start to realize how to think. So you you learn how you think. And a lot of people don't understand what that means. 
but essentially you start to realize what is going on in your brain from a very latent point of view and also a very uh, a surface level point of view. So things where we system A, system B thinking, right? So reactive thought, right? So those are very natural top of mind, but you start to realize and you you listen to that voice in your head. And that is the little voice that guides you in every single decision that compounds, right? Being at this podcast today, right? Not eating or eating certain 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 foods, right? Or drinking, right? So all these things are habits that is because of the little voice in your head uh, that you start to get comfortable with. It's hard, no doubt, uh, but you learn a lot from from being with yourself. Yeah. So you would say it's like going to this vipassana meditation is like dissolving a lot of the things that you have in your mind and kind of understanding a lot more about how it works. Yes. So the first three days is really just breathing in terms of like knowing how to breathe. And that's like a challenge because you do it so organically every day. So three days of just learning how to breathe again, that was eye-opening. And then the next seven days was really like going deeper into like why, like what do you, what? and it's non-religious. I think that's an important point to, to bring out. So there is nothing that is religion focus, uh, but it's very much on like the self sensation, meditation. Yeah. So everyone would have a bit of meditation, right? You use an app, you know, mm. you've done a corporate workshop, but after you spend like a full 10 days with yourself, you start to realize how to think. Yeah. Is it something that you keep inside of you or that you should repeat every year or every couple of years? To understand again, mm. for example, you did an Iron Man. Probably you looked really good. Mm. You were super fit. I was, yeah. But then, if you don't continue to <laughs> yeah. train, yeah, you can you lose your fitness. Yeah. You can even become fat, right? Yeah, yeah. The same with the mind. Yeah, you can do all these things. You can spend ten days doing a silent retreat, but probably you're gonna forget mm. how to catch your feelings and how your own kind of feelings yeah. and emotion system works mm. after a while if you don't do it again. Yeah. The recommended guideline guideline is to do it every year, like a 10-day retreat every year. And again, in practice, to meditate every single morning and evening for do, 30 minutes. Do you do that? I don't. Yeah. Zero minutes or not 30 minutes? Almost none. Nothing? Yeah, none. Okay. So the reality, again, in theory and practice is very different. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, objectively. Yeah. Always. Being very real, right? Yes. So, But I would highly recommend everyone to try this at least once in their life because it's a challenge, right? It's almost like a like a, a diet you would go on. It's really like in terms of like a social media diet. No access to your phone. You don't talk to anyone for 10 days. But you see people. You, you see just cannot people. talk to people. You, just, you can't, can't even look at them in the eye. So you, the goal is to not have eye contact. What happens if you have an eye contact? You quickly look away. <laughs> karma, yeah. karma punishes yeah, you. Like, yeah, so it's great for introverts. It's challenging for me being a more of an extrovert. You know, I love to talk, to feel the the silence, right? Um, yeah. So, you know, it's difficult to continue the practice every single day. But if I could, I would have gone every single year. But now with the baby, again, circumstance. But I'll definitely do it again in my life. Yeah. Maybe we do it together next time. I'm very interested. Yes. And it's everywhere around the world. So you could do one in Bali. Where did you go? I went to Korea. 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 Amazing facilities. Shout out to the Where Korea. Where is that? In the mountains somewhere? The Jeonju. Or? Yeah. It's actually quite high up. Um, but it's near to a farm. So it's nice. Different. What, what yeah. do you eat there? Vegetarian. So no killing. Yeah. Only vegetarian because it kind of, it helps you. Yeah. Helps it, you. And you lose weight. Uh, I... I presumably muscle mass as well because mm. you just sit there and meditate every day. Uh, but, you know, you feel a lot cleaner in terms of thought, in terms of like the body systems and you only eat two meals a day. Yeah. How many meals a day do you eat now? Uh, now I, I've gone back to three. So I used to do intermittent fasting for a while. But after a while, it's also difficult to keep up because of lifestyle, because of, of social with my family. We eat breakfast together. So, in the end, we went back, I went back to three meals and tried to work out at least three times a week. Have you ever tried fasting? Yes. For a prolonged period one of time? Maximum one day. 24 hours. Very cranky, yeah. Water, very cranky. Very cranky, yeah. Did you? That's the, yeah. the beginning, that's normal. Yeah. 
I've done nine days on water. Yeah. Oof. And I had a guest, I had a guest uh, a few yeah. weeks ago mm -hmm. who did, uh, we talked about that and I was like, you know, most people I say, I've done five days, seven days, nine days on water. Yeah. People are like, what? Are you crazy? And this dude was like, yeah, I've done 21 days. Oh. I was aiming 28, but after, at some point, you know, I wanted to eat. Yeah. So I ate, I ate after 21 days. Okay. And he said, my goal is 40 days. Maybe we can do it together. I was like, mm, yeah. yeah, I'll think about it. The 10 days retreat, yeah. absolutely. The twin, the 40 days um, on water. Yeah. Uh, probably not going to happen for me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Like it feels, it feels very not biologically um, uh, natural. So after... To yeah. stop eating? That's very interesting eating. for someone within yeah. the health space. Yeah. Because there's a lot of benefits to fasting. Yeah, that's also for what me, we read. For me, it yeah. saved my life. It's amazing. It's amazing. Like, like yeah. I had a lot of, I had like a really positive really, from the... Yeah, and I had like three years like terrible disease and syndrome. And okay. it really helped me. It was the AG, first yeah. stepping stone of my recovery. Mm. A seven day water fast and then a nine day water fast and then a five day water fast with biohacking, taking herbs, nootropics to yep. regenerate neuroplasticity and a bunch yep. of stuff. Absolutely amazing. Interesting. Because of the autophagy process. Yeah. For actually for your, could be Immune, physical pain yeah. or mental health pain. Okay. Absolutely amazing. But not fun to do, to yeah. be honest. Yeah. Because the, 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 you know, eating is just so such a social moment, yeah. as you said. And yeah. when you lack this social moment, your life becomes... I don't want to say empty, but kind of a, a bit sad, you know, like, yeah. oh, you, we, we in, unconsciously look forward to the dinner or yeah. the lunch yeah. Social, because, right? because it tastes good, mm -hmm. gives you dopamine, but also because I'm, what else do I do otherwise? Yeah. Oh, I'm just going to work more. Oh, I'm going to, wh yeah. where is my kind of break, you know, yeah. it's known. So people say, oh, it's much better. It makes me more productive. You need to sleep much less. Also, you sleep four or five hours. You're good. Yep. Because you don't, you know, 50% of your energy is used for digestion. Mm. So if you don't eat, you have, you have twice as much energy mm. to not only live your life, mm. but also perform better, but also heal yourself, right? Yep. That's why it's so amazing. But, uh, but it's, um, it's a bit sad. <laughs> it's a bit sad. Yeah. You talked about biohacking. Mm-hmm. What's the definition, right? I guess everyone, Absolutely. yeah, everyone has a definition of biohacking. What, um, what have you learned about biohacking and how does it kind of fit into what you guys are doing yeah, with so, Mito mm -hmm. Health? So my earlier versions of biohacking when I was working on the finance startup was weight loss, right? So I've naturally been a very big guy, right? So from young, always very 90th percentile in terms of weight. Lost a lot of it when I went to the army, uh, and then tried to keep it off. Um, but naturally, I'm quite big. So so weight loss has always been my version of biohacking. So anything related to that, like keto, I was trying paleo, I was trying calisthenics, like all these were my versions. Because biohacking sure. is very different, right? For you, if it's mental, then the techniques for mental biohacking would be very different. Yeah, so that's earlier days. But right now, the way that we are very focused on is really preventative health. So it's not, so much the traditional way of biohacking, but it's around extending health span. So that has been like the main mission and thesis of what we do as a business at Mito Health. What's um, the mission in one sentence? Yeah, we want to extend health spans of the population, right? So that's the massive vision. Like health span extension is, is key to everything that we do. So every diagnostic we do, every intervention we do is around extending health span. What does health span mean? Mm -hmm. Because we have something called lifespan, which yeah. is I live longer. Yeah. But I don't want to live longer if I feel like exactly. crap or if yeah. I'm not healthy, right? Exactly. So what is health span? So if we imagine it as a curve, right? Health span is like the years that are free from disease, right? So it could be cancer, mm. it could be heart attack, stroke, it could be Alzheimer's, dementia, or metabolic syndrome, like diabetes, right? So the moment you would contract any of this one disease, your your curve just shifts down below the 50% line. So 50% quality of life, as, as explained with my, my own father, was very bad, right? You can't eat on your own. You can't change your clothes on your own. You can't move on your own. You, you have to be in a wheelchair. It's not a great place to be, right? In terms of quality of life. So 
by keeping people healthy for longer is the idea of a health span. So a health span might be 60 years, but your lifespan might be 63 years. So the last three years might not be in the best quality of, of life. Because you don't want to live to 60, 63, example, and then like from 30 to 63, you're in like a below 50% of your quality of life. That's not what we what we want to do. We want to keep people healthy for longer. That's health span. Yeah. Before continuing on the mito health mm -hmm. and the health span subject, because you talked about your dad. Mm -hmm. You know, something that people say at work, I mean, in life in general, they say there is the work version, I mean, less and less, but there's the mm -hmm. work version of yourself and then there is the life, yeah. personal life, right? And it's mm -hmm. separate. Our generation, we're more realizing that it's all one person. Yes. I'm absolutely terrible at splitting both. Mm -hmm. So for example, if I go, if I have a girlfriend and we're having issues, it's going to fuck up my mental health and yeah. brain so much yeah. that the business suffers. I'm, I'm like, fuck the business. Like, yeah. Because, you know, as a man, you're like, I yeah. need to solve the problem. What's the biggest issue? Yeah. If the business goes more or less well, like yeah. problem, girlfriend problem or issue. But yeah. then like, so like managing, for me, at least managing multiple things at the same time, you prioritize mm -hmm. and then the rest is like pretty much not taken care of mm -hmm. until the priority is sorted. Yeah. How the hell do you build a business mm. when your father is going through cancer and is in such a bad place? Yeah, not, not great. Uh, so I think that I have, to, I have to really thank my mom and my brother who, who did a lot of the heavy lifting because I think as a family unit, you know, you, you come together to, to like help each other at different points in time. So I think our families were very understanding. Like my family was very understanding that I was dealing with problems at work every day, but also, you know, was dealing with like a family issue. So they were stepping up to help out. And my then girlfriend, wife as well, was very understanding uh, in, the, in that scenario. Um, but yeah, I think it's not easy. So whoever is going through a very tough time with your family and also running a business, I understand how you feel. Um, just hang in there. It will get better. It's a phase. You just always have to remember that it's a phase. Uh, things will get better either way, right? Either, you know, one story ends, another starts again. Yeah, it's, it's, it, will, it will get better. Yeah. What's the size of the challenge with Mito Health? The size of the challenge is uh, 8 billion people, right? That's a way to frame it. So 8 billion people are, are aging. So that's the population of the of the world today. So the 8 billion people who are aging and we think that there will be a silver tsunami of what we what we are seeing in Japan and Singapore across the world very soon. So yeah, which is so the tsunami basically represents the shift in demographic of older people to younger people. Right. So people who are beyond 40, 50, 40, 50 years old will, will soon be a larger population than the people who are younger. Right. And it's, it's, it's very natural because as if you check out the global stats, you can actually go online and search the world population. You can look at the amount of deaths and the amount of births every day. Yeah, there are a lot more births than there are deaths because people are living longer and longer. Quality of life might not be great, but people are living longer. And what that means is that the population starts to expand across the world and there will be a lot of sick people that we need to, 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 to take care of, right? So the yeah. population is extending. Yeah. There's more and more people. Yeah. Because if you listen to a lot of very smart people, mm -hmm. Elon Musk included, there is actually not enough children. Yeah. There's not enough babies. Yeah. And we probably going to plateau around 9 billion people and that's a catastrophe for humans because we're not reproducing yeah. at the fast pace enough. Yeah. Uh, there is the projection of that. But what if you look at the today's situation of like health span and life spans, the immediate problem that I see beyond the population of the world not being sufficient to, to sustain life and stuff is the shift in the, in the demographic. So mm -hmm. I'm more concerned about that because if you look at the strain on healthcare systems, it's actually not sustainable. So what we need to do is to move upstream. We, we can't just treat people when they're ill or when they're sick. We need to look at 
preventative methods. We need to look at longevity biomarkers before this uh, becomes such a big issue. Yeah. Do you think people actually care about that? Well, for now, the interesting start for us is really the executives. So we are targeting executives because executives are the ones who realize that health is wealth. So that's our start. Mm. Uh, that's our beach head market. Yeah. yeah. So people who earn a decent amount and they realize that without health, there is no wealth, right? So we start with those um, who are willing to pay. So we have paying clients, very happy. We are helping them optimize their health span by looking at their biomarkers, interventions, supplements, uh, nutrition, workouts. And then the goal from this is to learn enough so that we could build the next version that is more downstream and more downstream. I think every kind of customer profiles would require different kind of uh, messaging, different kind of feature sets to allow them to have the same idea outcome of extending health span. Yeah. We talked about us being at university and wanting to become a consultant, right? Or accountants. There's something we call the big four in accounting. Mm -hmm. PwC, yeah. KPMG, EY, yeah. and Deloitte, yeah. right? But there's also something we call the big four in health. Mm -hmm. I mean, something you call the big four, which are ah. the the four things or diseases that kill the most people today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are these big four? Yeah. So it's uh, popularized by Peter Thier from the book Outlive, right? So we subscribe to that. So the idea, the first thing is actually cardiovascular problems like heart attack and stroke. So that's a big one. So it's to do with your heart. Second one being cancer. So cancer, we already align one out of two to three people would get cancer in their lifetimes, early stage or late stage. The third one being metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome would be problems like type 2 diabetes, which is diabetes that is not inherited, is by, ins by being insulin resistant. And then the fourth one is neurodegenerative problems like Alzheimer's and dementia. So very key body systems in any human the moment you get one of these four, it's highly likely that your mortality and, and death becomes a lot nearer. Yeah. Insulin resistance? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That means that your body can't create enough insulin to keep your glucose levels down and, and that creates havoc in all your different body parts, your kidneys, your livers. And it's because of uh, overconsumption of glucose or sweets. Yeah. And then it's type 2 that diabetes. Yeah. So those things we track as well. So that's an interesting one because now back to, I mean, you said now you are talking to executives, mm -hmm. probably these people are already doing some gym and yep. thinking about their health, right? Mm -hmm. But now let's look at everyone else, mm -hmm. right? You are a Singaporean, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you think that the traditional meals that are prepared by loving aunties <laughs> in the Asian household mm -hmm are good at preventing diabetes. Mm. One of the diseases that kills the most people today. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a tough question because on the one hand, they're so delicious most of the time. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, I, I do think it's also in balance. So, you know, you can have a, a, a great meal today in terms of like the quality and quantity might be very unhealthy but on the other days you compensate for that so I think it's more like finding that balance and everyone has a different balance um, and the government is doing a lot so they are making if you watch the blue zones there the, one of the big themes there was about making healthy the default option and that's interesting because yeah, healthy the default option, meaning that every time you go to a hawker, there is a lower is a lower cost product that is actually healthy. So in 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 different parts of the world, the lower cost product is naturally the more unhealthy ones. But locally, the government is actually funding like brown rice, like vermicelli, like all these products are actually discounted because they wanted to make it the default option. So it's easy to get a healthy meal for affordable price at a hawker actually. So you are saying that mm -hmm. in Singapore, yeah. the government is kind of subsidizing brown rice or other sort of healthy options to hawker centers mm -hmm. so that people Choose don't it. even have an excuse yeah. to say it's too expensive no. to eat healthy. Exactly. Is there a certain type of hawkers where you have like a, a certification of like yeah. health? Yeah. You know? 
And so there is a, the healthier choice. So that one is where you see a pyramid that tells you that it's healthier to eat brown or red rice versus white rice. So that's one example. Another example is the nutri grading. So that just came out uh, this year. So if you visit the supermarket, whole milk like might be graded C, but a low-fat skim milk might be graded B. So it's easy to know. But every choose, hawker yeah. today yeah. is subsidized by the government. Yeah. I can go to any random hawker place and think, and not have to worry too much about... You have to look for the help. option. Yeah, okay. the option is there, but it, it again, like what you said, it's default. It's like... There is no reason to say like, oh no, I need to buy a salad. No, you don't need to buy a salad. Like you can go to uh, uh, what we call a mixed rice shop. So you can just choose brown rice, vegetables and stir fry vegetables, uh, lower fat, lower oil. They are all available there. You can get eggs for maybe $3, $4. You don't need like a salad that costs $12. The mm-hmm. macros are similar, you know, yeah. So there is this thing there, but there is still the traditions, which is meals. I mean, it depends on the culture. There's different yeah. culture in Singapore. But if you think about Chinese or mm-hmm. Malay or like yeah. all these very yeah. rich food. Yeah, coconut where, oil, coconut milk. Yeah. Where you might also almost be seen as a... I've been criticized already by my previous girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah, hey, you don't adapt to local culture. When yeah. I was in my early 20s, I, I lived in Shanghai, Hong Kong, Singapore, and I was eating in Hawker Center all yeah. the time, right? Yeah. But now, now I eat mega healthy. Yeah. And for me, mega healthy is basically what's boring for most people, you know, chicken breast, yeah. brown rice. Yeah. I, I count, I don't count everything anymore, but I used to count yeah. two, year, two years ago, macros and all that stuff. Yeah. So there is this big clash of like, for me, there's still a big pl- clash between like actual health mm-hmm. and culture and traditional food that are very rich. And if you look at, because you're in the longevity space, people who are really focused on that go to the very extreme, right? Mm. So you said, uh, you talked about balance, which is probably like more healthy for most people in terms of like how they think. But if you really want to optimize your health span, as you called it, Mm -hmm. right? It's probably good to be more extreme than not because we all know that the problem is the human brain is i'm not gonna drink coke right yeah. but then i drink coke one day because oh why not yeah the problem is the day after i want my coke yeah i want it i feel the sugar yeah I, 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 the, the high the yeah. same the same as the coffee same it's as different, the coffee, but like, yeah you want it right so yeah. i want to have the sweet and sour pork right yeah. or yeah. chicken or yeah like because it tastes good like it is much better yeah. than a than a chicken breast with brown rice with zero sauce on the yeah. top, right? Mm. So is, the, is it even possible, right? Especially yeah. given how food is kind of ingrained in the, ingrained in the culture. Culture, yeah. It is challenging, no doubt. Um, but I think it's a, again, goes back to what your priorities are. So I guess if you're younger, you know, if you have a bit more what we call reserves. So we like to talk about reserves. Um, so muscle reserves, cognitive reserves. So if your reserves are more, you have more um, caloric deficit, like you can actually consume more because your basal metabolism is higher. Then yeah, I didn't go for it, right? You you need to try that curry chicken in once in your life, twice. I mean, you don't do it every day because if you do it every day, then naturally it becomes a, a self-fulfilling prophecy of, of, a, of a bad habit. But once in a while... What's the once in a while? For yeah. example, in gym, yeah. right, yeah. there's the cheat day. Cheat day. Is yeah. it how people should look at that? They say the cheat day yeah. is I'm going to have that nice chicken curry, Yeah. but only once a week? Or is it like, only, like how should people concretely approach this? Yeah, so th- there are studies that show that um, if we start off with the mentality of the cheat day, it's probably not going to sustain. I'm sure you read those as well. So like mentally, if you go in, you know, seven days, one day a week, you want to eat all you want, it's not going to be sustainable. So the approach here is like, how do you look at replacements, right? So instead of having that sugary drink, how do you replace that sugary drink with sparkling water? Kombucha. Kombucha, right? (laughs) Yeah. I love it. Kombucha is the best freaking way to replace any soda. Yeah. Recently, I've I've tried this uh, probiotic, uh, pro and postbiotic soda. Yeah. So zero calories. So they put stevia and... and, and, uh, some replacements, but it's fizzy. So it tastes nice. 
and there is probiotics in the in the soda. So that's another way to replace. So, okay, that's more expensive. Granted, yeah, that that is definitely more expensive. Yeah. Okay, that's very interesting because you talk about stevia, right? Yeah, which is a good way to replace sugar. Yeah, but if you because the poem is like the rabbit hole is endless mm. online. Yeah. <laughs> I can replace this with that, but yeah. this thing also has another has problem. Something, For yeah. example, if I drink Coke Zero yeah. instead of drinking normal Coke, yeah. I'm not going to have my yeah. 15 or 34 sugar yeah. pieces in there, right? But I'm going to have some other type of product that actually are very bad for testosterone. Mm. And then you start to feel, I've, I've been through this journey yeah. and I'm like, I'm drinking only uh, Diet Coke now because I, two years ago I was counting my macros and yeah. everything, right? But then I learned later that this is not good for my testosterone level, which is very important. So I'm like, do I choose the sugar or do I choose the testosterone? Oh, I'm probably going to choose the sugar. And it, it's kind of endless. Yeah. And also there is a theory for everything, right? Yeah. There is a kind of like data supporting every yeah. opinion online. Every, yeah. That's a very big challenge. So yeah. like how do people think about all this stuff and not get, you know, we always say uh, analysis, uh, paralysis by analysis. Yeah, yeah. The way we approach it at Mito and personally as well is to experiment, right? So you experiment, you take this for A-B tests, right? Yeah. So you take this for your own, use some wearables, right? Track your weight, you know, track your sleep, HRV levels, sleep cycles, and these things help, right? So over time, you find what replaces the best for you. I'll give you one real example. So I love watching football and having a bag of chips. I love, I used to love it so a lot. good. Right? Yeah. The, the <laughs> yeah. natural one with just the salt. Yeah, there, there is. Or do you like the one with like the no, weird shit yeah, taste? Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> the, the pep, black pepper, sea salt. So I love those, but I realized that the, the replacement to that was actually uh, uh, popcorn. So popcorn that is, is sea salt popcorn. Coconut oil and sea salt popcorn. So there's this one that uh, is, is a blue bear, if you've seen it in the, in the shelves. And you look okay. at the... The calories is definitely like one fifth, and it gives the same feeling of of having that. So, that I find is a lot better because it replaces the same craving, at a much lower cost. Understand. Yeah. So that is the approach. Cost for I, your health. Cost right? for health. Yeah. yeah. It's more expensive. You're right. It's more expensive. Yeah. <laughs> so that I agree. <laughs> Some are more expensive. No. The research shows also right. Like there is no amount of alcohol that is good. What does it show? Uh, exactly. So the one that I read, um, I mean, it's I can't remember the exact research paper, but basically no amount of alcohol is good, like at all. So even though, you know, you read things like Blue Zones, if you watch the Blue Zones thing. I didn't watch it, but everybody talks about it. Yeah. So there's this phrase that, I mean, the, the one, there's this study that says wine every day at 5 p.m. Mm. That leads to longevity. Yeah. Uh, but that's very anecdotal, right? So you're just looking at people in... in uh, uh, where is that place? Okinawa in Japan. Mm. Uh, you're looking at somewhere in Italy, somewhere in Greece, Ikaria, right? Yeah. And then... They talk about Singapore too. They talk about Singapore. Yeah, I think we are the sixth blue zone. It's good though. Do you know why? Yeah. Um, the medical system is very, is very well built. Yeah. And it's really taking care of you all the way to when you're old. Uh, and there's a lot of nuances to that. I mean, some examples personally is that for the guys, we are all expected to maintain some level of fitness all the way to our 40. Yeah, because of the military and stuff. Yeah. Okay, so you... So That's what does that mean? More. It means like... Yeah. Because you have to be in military until yeah. 40? Yeah, every huh. year. Every year we go back for huh. two weeks. It's two weeks. Two weeks, okay. yeah. Until 40? Until 40, at least. So for some people, it's until 50. Even if you yeah. do... So what? So you do what, two years? Two years. And then you do two weeks every year? Exactly. Yeah. Wow, because in Switzerland, it's... Uh, yeah. Oh, it's required it's, as well. Yeah, yeah, it's required exactly. Yeah. But it's either you do a lot more in the front. I think it's yeah. like you do eleven months. Eleven months. But I, I, I think because I didn't do it, I skipped it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I think it's eleven months or twelve, like up front. Yeah. And then you're pretty much done, and maybe like you have two weeks or one week every year. Okay. Until thirty. Thirty. That's or very you fast. do six yeah. months and then you have more to do every year until oh, okay. until 30, but it's actually until 30. Uh, uh, yeah. That's interesting. Regarding the the drinking, it's really interesting because I remember my mother, she was always telling me, we're talking about the Queen of England. Mm -hmm. 
and she was kind of not really famous for drinking one glass of red wine every day. Yeah. And that's the reason why she would go on to live yeah, long know, until... 90s, like, right? Yeah. I think, hundreds? hundreds? I think hundreds, might be hundred. Okay. And so I kind of like have this kind of myth also in my mind. Yeah. But if you, exactly, if you read studies and if you just do the experiment with yourself, yeah. Like yeah. of not drinking for a month or two months or yeah. six months, yeah. you realize that alcohol is... Yeah. basically poison yeah it like, is it's poison it is. and like yeah. why would you do that to yourself i mean it's cool for me i'm, I'm not against a few glasses of wine here and there but yeah the you know the heavy drinking that you would no. that you would do in your yeah. early 20s, 20s yeah like i don't even understand yeah. like why we would it because it tastes so bad yeah. just the taste is so bad why do that to yourself you know we we have clients i mean this a bit on the work that we do but we actually see the values in the liver scores so the AST, ALT, biomarkers that shows early fatty liver disease. Yeah, it shows up based on their lifestyle habits. How do you measure that? Uh, exactly. It's in the blood. It's in the blood. Yeah, but yeah. what do you... How can you say, okay, uh, you drink that many times a week? Yeah. Yeah. And therefore, at this age, oh, now we can measure that? Yeah. Or is it more, uh, if you stop now, after six months or one year or a few months, we'll see a difference? It's usually the first one. So it's uh, because of the heavy drinking and then it leads to like scarring of your liver. Okay. That has irreversible damage potentially. Can you not reverse that? You, It's difficult to. Uh, and yeah, it's difficult to because once the liver is scarred, it's generally quite difficult to to unscar the liver. Um, but what we generally recommend our clients is to know whether it's their values are in order. So that is part of like the biomarkers we test for generally. But it shows you, right? It shows you that by heavy drinking, like it does lead to such liver disease, early liver disease. What do you mean by heavy drinking? Yeah, more than... So we have a criteria. So less than five units a week is okay what's generally a, what's a unit unit is less than half a pint yeah there's a specific definition so less than half a pint one pint is not one unit yeah there's so 2.5 pints 2.5 a week is, is, is five units five thereabouts yeah therefore that's heavy drinking no that's that's actually low more than 14 is heavy more so 14. almost 14 yeah so that's about seven pints more than seven pints so one week. per day one per day and it's actually worse if you do all seven pints on one day. There's also research to show it's that. It's worse than if you do one per day. Yeah, yeah. It's worse than if you do one per day. Yeah. I mean, it's not an encouragement an yeah, no. for anyone yeah. out there <laughs> to just like drink every day instead of like once a day. Every exactly. Day. exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But I think it's it's worth noting that all these lifestyle choices add up, right? Um, how Compound. much sleep? Like, yeah, exactly. It compound. It compounds like how much sleep you're getting as well. All these things actually matter quite a lot. And they're all yeah. interconnected. Yeah. Because yeah. if you drink, you're going to sleep exactly. much less well. You are familiar with the HRV, your scores. Uh, yeah. You have wearables that track your sleep scores as well. You can do a simple experiment. Um, the amount of alcohol or caffeine even, like caffeine, alcohol that you drink prior to your sleep, how does that affect your sleep scores? And you can A-B test over time. Yeah. Can you talk about the caffeine one? It's really inter- a yeah. really interesting one because I have some friends who tell me I can drink as many coffee as I want. Yeah. It's not going to affect my sleep. I can drink cafe yeah. or coffee just before sleeping. Yeah. It's not affecting my sleep. And usually these people yeah. have crazy anxiety problems already. Yeah. And they can't even link one to the other. Mm. Not even talking about the sleep itself. Yeah. Like, if you have anxiety problem, don't drink alcohol, don't yeah. drink coffee. Yeah. yeah, but I love coffee. Fine. So yeah. how does coffee and caffeine affect sleep? Yeah. And is, it, is there such thing as people who are yeah. not affected in their sleep by caffeine? Yeah. yeah. I think there's two ways to look at it. Like, the first way is that there's actually uh, genetic studies you can do to figure out whether you are more predisposed to caffeine sensitivity versus other people. That's one way in terms of nutrition. The other way is actually to actually do an experiment, right? So the general rule of thumb is to not drink beyond 3 p.m. 3 p.m. Uh, 3 p.m., right? Uh, or six hours before you sleep, right? So it's either or, depending on what time you sleep. So the best time to sleep is 9 p.m., right? Okay, uh, yeah. a few things 
why six hours yeah. because of half life or like how do ah uh, I I don't have the specifics okay. yeah and why 9 p.m. Uh, 9 p.m. I mean you have to go through the different sleep stages mm. so if you're familiar with the sleep stages light sleep deep sleep REM sleep and awake uh, and then we go in cycles so so I track my sleep using a aura ring and a Garmin watch so every morning when I wake up it's a bit of a habit I look at what my score is. Uh, and generally speaking, it's true that if I drink coffee late in the day because of work uh, mm. or just because of habit, it's not great. Um, my you're a bit addicted. To all uh, addicted, it. yeah. C- caffeine is a it's drug. It's very addictive. It's a drug. Yeah, Absolutely. it is. Yeah. And it tastes nice. <laughs> it tastes nice and it's very addictive. Like it's if right. you remove caffeine, yeah. you, you tell people, try stop drinking for a month or two months or three months. Yeah. You're like, okay, yeah, no problem. Probably won't. Yeah. M- manage to do it but it's fine yeah try telling them yeah try to remove caffeine for a week not a month or are you crazy i love my coffee it makes me feel so happy and so yeah. we're completely addicted to this we are we me are. included i have only one per day but like it's it's like yeah. just thinking one day i'm gonna remove caffeine today i can definitely do it but like there is like this lack there's this lack yeah exactly. it's bad yeah it's bad especially because caffeine People say, I mean, there's a lot of positive side effects, etc. But like, this also, it's also a very strong, actually, nootropic mm. that creates a lot of problems to sleep and anxiety yeah. for yeah. people. So, yeah. So I think you have to understand yourself at the end of the day, like how it affects your, it affects everyone differently. Um, so for me, I take it twice. I, I I drink two cups of coffee a day. So one in the morning, one usually after lunch when the slum, after lunch slum comes. Mm. Uh, and so far, it's just for me personally, before 3 p.m., it's fine. Uh, and my sleep scores hold up. I go through enough cycles, sleep cycles. So yeah, that's... How long generally. do you sleep per night? Now with a baby, it's hard. Mm. <laughs> yeah, because I wake up every 3 a.m. But in the past, from 10 p.m. all the way to 7. So it's quite a decent amount of... Wow. At least... That's also yeah, 10 nine hours. hours. Yeah, nine I mean, hours. Yeah. Nine hours in the bed or sleep time? In the bed. Okay. Yeah, in the bed. So maybe I take around 15, 20 minutes to sleep. Roll around a little sleep routine. So something interesting. Right now we have a baby and we realize that uh we we got a sleep coach for him. Sleep coach. Yeah, it's a yeah. very common thing for parents uh, yeah. right now. And you never thought about it, but the same things applies since since we're babies. Uh, the concept of sleep training. Right, the environment we are sleeping in, mm. the words you use to tell him to sleep, uh, and not only that, right? Yeah, it's it's very interesting, and you start to realize that we are conditioned from a very young age, uh, to sleep, and sleep is a large chunk of our life, and a lot of people re- forgot tend to forget this down down the road as well. Um, so a lot yeah. of people put sleep secondary. Yeah, to everything. Yeah. I need to wake up. Uh, yeah. I need to work and all yeah. that stuff when if your sleep pattern yeah. is not in check yeah. or I would say even mastered yeah. the rest of your day yeah. and therefore the rest of your life yeah. is not going to be mastered and in check at all because yeah. you can't think straight when you're underslept yeah, and, exactly. lot, and too many people just don't understand that yeah. or at least when you're young you don't understand that and you like start to realize man like if I want to be productive and do some yeah. useful things with my days and with my life yeah I'd rather yeah. understand how to sleep better. Yeah. So sleep, we always measure in two ways, quantity and quality. So the way to measure quantity is easy, is the amount of time in bed. But the quality one is the big one. So it's like, do you wake up feeling refreshed? Do you not wake up feeling refreshed? So that's a, that's a nice proxy for a sleep score. And we always tell our clients, right? <laughs> uh, lack of sleep is actually carcinogenic. Like there are research to show that it is carcinogenic. Meaning it gives you cancer. Yeah, it could give you cancer because it's not enough recovery. Yeah. Your cells are not recharging. Um, yeah, so then it can lead potentially to cancer. Yeah. So how, for example, for me, I mean, mm-hmm. for you too, you're an entrepreneur, right? Mm-hmm. So technically, I mean, you have teams who rely on you, but technically you can wake up whenever you want in the morning mm-hmm. if you don't have meetings in the morning. Yeah. So it's kind of easier yeah. to say, I'll sleep until I wake up and feel refreshed. I wake up, I feel like, uh, you know, I've, I've got hit by a truck. I can still sleep a bit more. Yeah. Because you know that it's not the input yeah. 
that matters it's during output, your day. Yeah. It's the output. It's not like I'm, I have to be eight hours at work. It's I have to get shit done. So I'd rather spend a bit less time working or mm. working later, mm. but get shit done. So I can sleep longer, right? Yeah. Now for people who have the classic lifestyle, which is I need to be at work at 9 a.m. Mm. There's this additional kind of unconscious pressure on like, yeah. I need to sleep. Yeah. Now or better, you know, I need to sleep well, but I have this kind of time constraint. Mm. How do you do, how, what do you recommend for people who have this, they who need to show up at a certain time yeah. to still wake up fresh despite the, the constraint yeah. of time? I believe in the concept of the circadian rhythm, mm. uh, which you are familiar probably with, with the concept of sleep. So you can actually adjust it over time. And it's the same thing we see in babies, like when the babies go to sleep at certain time, let's say, so they sleep at around 7 to 8 p.m. every night. And then they wake up all the way at 6 a.m. So they really sleep a long time. Maybe there's a feed one or two times in the night where they get hungry because their stomachs are not big, uh, big enough. Um, same for adults. You realize that after a while, you can condition your body to sleep at a certain time and to wake up at a certain time. And then you would get enough sleep cycles within that that time period. What's a while? Sorry? You said after a while? After a while. What yeah. does that mean? It depends. The yeah. classic 21 yeah. days to change a habit, is it? Uh... Depends, yeah. So like, for example, when people travel into a different time zone, mm. it takes them three days to be adapted to that time zone, right? Because if not, you'll be waking up at strange times in the night. Like I, I have trouble ad uh, adopting to European time zones when I fly there. Yeah. Is there a such thing as a, it takes a certain amount of days by hours of time difference. Mm. Because but, I, I don't know, because yeah. you're saying like three days, for example, yeah. if I go to Europe, yeah. honestly, I love it because... You you adapt quickly to the... The thing is, yeah. it makes me, it forces me, to, I'm, I'm not someone who wakes up very early in the morning. So it kind of, I wake up naturally early mm. because I go there mm. and, you know, let's say there's six hours time difference now with Switzerland. Mm. So if I go to Switzerland now, I, I'm going to wake up, if it's here 1 p.m., mm. Now, if it's here 12, it's going to be 6 a.m. there. Mm. So I'll wake up naturally anyway at 6. And I will have plenty of sleep because it's the equivalent of 12 here, right? Yeah. So it's fine. When I come back to Asia, yeah. every time I need a week. Yeah. A week at least. Like because you, the, my Condition, brain doesn't really yeah. understand at all what's happening. There. Yeah. I feel there's an aging element to it. I don't know. It's not absolutely research back. But when I was younger, it was easier. And then as you start to age, you kind of, these things start to take a bit longer and longer time. It's same for, for exercise. When I gym now, the, the time after training, the, the recovery, recovery time and the, the DOMS, right? Like the delayed onset of muscle soreness, it comes in harder, like mm -hmm. for, for some reason. Yeah. Is there something you recommend for people who travel a lot and experience a lot of jet lag to recover from jet lag yeah. faster? There is a way, uh, which is, is something that I personally do, but I don't recommend, which is melatonin. Mm. So actually by taking melatonin personally, I, I realized that it helps my body get into, even though it's artificial, right? It's almost like a nootropic. It tells your brain, it is a, it's a synthetic hormone, right? To create that feeling of feeling tired. And then you go to bed and it, it helps. When do you forward. take it? Uh, Once you're back or already before? Oh, no, no, when I'm, back. when I'm supposed to sleep. So within like 15 minutes, I feel really, really tired. And you can get it off the shelf also. Um, mm. And then you, I find it works for me. It might not work for other people. Then I feel like, okay, it's time to sleep. And then usually when you wake up, it's really, really crappy. But it shortens the time to adjust in, in my view. Yeah. One thing I do is uh, yeah. for a lot of different things, but for that one too, acupuncture. Mm. Oh, wow. Acupuncture is amazing for so many things, but one of them is every time you feel out of whack yeah. or you feel like your, yeah. your, your body is imbalanced, yeah. you just do it and jet lag is completely yeah. an, an imbalance in your body. So you go Here, once. Right? In, in Singapore or what? Everywhere yeah. I, go, I, have, I go to acupuncture. Wow. I love it. I'm okay. a needle addict. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Actually, maybe, maybe I am. it's the same it's thing amazing. with tattoo, right? Like maybe it's the same thing like uh, with tattoo? I've done it. I've done acupunctures twice. I've yeah. never done tattoo, but I know that people 
when they do like uh, there's some pain involved and then you, you feel ah, actually the, did you feel pain in acupuncture I do maybe it's not a good acupuncturist okay yeah. interesting I mean sometimes you feel some things but I never experienced like real like sharp pain okay. it's more like a lifesaver for me nice we talked about cancer before yeah and we said one out of two or three person will basically have mm -hmm. cancer during their life. We talked yeah. about that in the context of the insurance. Let's talk about that in the context of the prevention. Mm -hmm. What can people do to prevent cancer? So I think prevention comes from a few things. I think the ones that we feel as a company the most important are like lifestyle factors. So sleep and smoking so people would always think like oh, it's some diagnostics and stuff but smoking is the very low hanging fruit to not smoke to in order to bring down your risk of cancer by two to three times like that's proven and not only cancer right all your different horsemen that we talked about earlier and not yeah. only learn cancer no yeah any, any type, type of, of cancer. cancer it's carcinogenic right yeah so it affects all of your cells uh, and the people around you because secondhand smoke is proven to increase uh the the, pre, the 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 prevalence of cancer yeah so that's one what and about yeah. what about the elephant in the room mm -hmm. vaping everybody yeah. now thinks yeah. oh it's okay i stopped smoking i'm vaping it's okay forbidden forbidden in singapore everybody yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it tastes good it's different yeah. blah 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 what about vaping uh, and yeah. cancer uh, yeah I don't have enough research to back any of those, but I can see it similar to how people are looking at the replacement, right? So I think like for like, my understanding, this is not medically backed. My understanding is that it's less dangerous based on the nicotine. Uh, it's on, it's, uh, there is no tar, right? Because it's, it's not smoke. But my understanding is still addictive. It's still not good for your lungs. That's my very basic understanding. I, I don't have... And medical, we don't know yeah. the potential effect, it, other effects knows. it can have, It's very right? new, right? It's, it's like e-cigarettes. I mean, they've been around for what, four years? Three, three, four years now? Since like, I think start of COVID. So very new. Many people are doing it. Can't, yeah, can't I, be good. Can't be good. Can't yeah. be good yeah. because the cigarettes, yeah. you smoke a cigarette every now and then. The freaking vape. Mm. is all day long mm. and some people even in the bed oh like wow they, they all say oh, at home, oh man right? because, they all say yeah. the difference the cigarette you're done with the cigarette it's done right yeah, so you yeah. need to take another one yeah. right it just keeps going right and yeah. also you can't smoke inside yeah like yeah. the vape you can vape everywhere non-stop mm. all the time yeah don't have enough medical data but if it's not likely not good for your health it's probably it's not good for your health so just yeah. So I think cancer, that's one. So prevention is one. Mm -hmm. Detection is another one. So we look at cancer in two ways. Prevention, detection. So prevention, lifestyle factors. Don't smoke, sleep well, eat well, right? Eat less sugary foods. This is generally decreases your risk of, of cancer as a whole. Uh, on, on the detection side, there are cancer markers, tumor markers that debatable in terms of false positives and false negatives but it's a nice precursor to what we call uh something we are very excited about is liquid biopsy you familiar with liquid biopsy no. so liquid biopsy is this new uh like technology that allows you it's a new kind of blood test that looks into your blood to look for fragments of a shedding of dna's of cancer cells in your blood so it, if it's very early stage zero cancer the tumor would be somewhere and then you start to shed. So from the DNA that is shedding, you're able to tell what cancer that is. Yeah, so it's very new, very expensive, but we are starting to offer it also in Mito, uh, Mito Health starting Q4 this year. Yeah. How early should people start to think about those things? Yeah. When should I start thinking, if let's say I'm 20 or 25, mm -hmm. a woman or a, a man listening to this, when should I start thinking about stressing out about that? Oh man, I should get a test every year or every six months or whatever. Like how yeah. do I start my kind of health journey? Yeah. When we look at our clients, uh, what we do is we send them for a, a base panel. So we look at 63 different things in your blood. So 63 biomarkers. And it covers the four diseases we talked about. Uh, but most importantly, for any young person, you, so you reference the range is like 20s, right? Um, the cardiovascular problems and the metabolic problems are the big ones that they should be looking out for because this can happen just purely based on bad diet. So if you're obese, you hardly move, you smoke, like, highly likely your arteries are lined with cholesterol, 
your cholesterol particles are a lot bigger and we can actually look for those in your blood. Things like cancer, uh, it's a lot of it is also due to bad luck. So it could, some, of, some small part of it is due to genetics, but a large chunk is also due to luck. Uh, and those things can be de detected later on in life. Um, luck or lifestyle or both? A lot of luck, actually. Um, so you might be so you might have heard of people who have smoked their entire life no problem no problem people who did a lot of sport yeah yeah but that's the excuse that a lot of people use to yeah. eat like shit yeah. and to not do any sport on a baseline it's better to not do those things but it's also based on research shown that a lot of it is really also due to luck so mm. on a baseline you just don't do many of those things because it just increases your risks right but if you do those things and then you're also unlucky then it's going to be even worse for you So you are better off if like you don't do those things and you are unlucky and then you can detect it and then you can treat it, you can remove it and then you get a better life expectancy. Yeah. That's how we think about the different horsemen. Yeah. So young people look out for cardiovascular problems and we actually see it quite a lot. Um, so yeah, we just take care of your heart and your arteries and your blood vessels. Yeah. So if, if I'm someone in my early 30s and I want to start to get to the next level in terms of health, mm -hmm. what do you recommend me? Key mm -hmm. pillars. So the, the first one that you, you should do is to set a baseline. So what does that mean is that go for a checkup, um, understand your values and set targets, right? So you want to set targets to in terms of reducing some, certain values by certain degrees and work with your medical professional. We can be your medical professional if you, if you don't have one. So that's number one, setting baseline, going for a checkup and then building a strategy. What fits into your life? What do you enjoy doing? So a lot of people, like you shouldn't force yourself to do strength training if you're not someone who enjoys strength training, but do a similar, a similar activity. So some of them, uh, we have clients who don't like to do PT, uh, personal training. So then they end, they end up going for group strength classes, like I think BFT, F45. So it's circuits, mm -hmm. but there's elements of lifting weights at different Uh, parts of the circuit. So yeah, I think to find activities that fit into your life and not to force fit the, the recommendations into your, into your life. Nutrition, the same thing. Look for replacements. A lot of the low-hanging fruits are replacements. Yeah. How important is uh, strength training mm -hmm. for good health? It's very for, important. For yeah. both men and women. Yes. More important for women, actually. Because of Why? the risk of, uh, so postmenopausal for women, uh, the brittle bone disease like osteoporosis is very real, uh, post 50 years old. So someone like my mom, she's 58 now. Uh, we are sending her to a DEXA scan. So DEXA scan is like a gold standard for body composition in terms of fat, muscle, and, blo uh, and bone density. So strength training basically helps build better bones, better skeletal muscle mass, and also stronger uh, and, and also more muscle reserves. So that allows them, uh, allows most people as they, as they age, beyond the age of 30 for everyone, male and female, you tend to lose muscle mass every single year. And so it's research back that if you don't do anything, don't do strength training, don't eat enough protein, you are generally going to lose muscle mass every single year. Yeah. Last one. Yeah. Regarding enough protein. Yeah. Is it possible to have enough protein by being a vegan? So the, the, the problem is actually the concept of the bioavailability of like the protein. Um, so generally speaking, based on what we know and the, the research that we've, we've read, uh, plant-based protein, like you would need a lot more plant, plant protein to actually compensate for the amount that you would get in traditional meat-based protein. Um, so, so you need to stuff yourself more, yeah, a lot to be able to match the amount of protein absorption right? and, and and availability of the the the, the plant based protein. Yeah, so it's not impossible. Um, I mean, if you look at the there was a Netflix documentary, I think it was about the yeah. uh, the athletes, right? Athletes, yeah. yeah. So it is possible. Um, but I think it's 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 consuming more based on again the research that we've read. Um, clients ask that question quite a bit as well. Because do you take whey? Do you take pea protein? Um, yeah, soy protein. Can you? And I mean, we talked about the protein, but mm -hmm. now, can people get all the necessary nutrients on a vegan diet? Uh, 
Well, I, I don't know enough on the full diet point of view because there's like so many different replacements, right? I think there's like soy, there's there is plant-based. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I don't know enough about the complete diet, but specifically like protein, that's the, the big question we always get. Yeah. Amazing. Thank yeah. you so much for doing this. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for having me and I enjoyed the conversation. That was yeah. awesome. Where can people connect with you? You can find me on LinkedIn or Instagram. Uh, LinkedIn is uh, health-related stuff. We talk about what we're doing as a company, what are the latest signs that we are actually injecting into our diagnostics, uh, into our AI models. That's LinkedIn. Instagram is like I talk about my family trying to to grow a, a young a young one, an NFT, a young newborn, right? How do we <laughs> build logic into his in his thinking and, and grow him as a person? Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.